And then we're going to pray for those people who need the prayers this morning, and then we'll worship, okay? So this is my Bible. You know how this goes. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have, and it says I can do what it says I can do. This is our standard, right? It doesn't matter how we're feeling. It doesn't matter what we're thinking. This is my standard. What does God say about it? You know, Pastor Mike has been teaching about God's plan, how Jesus was born, his death and resurrection, and he's been spending time on the fact that Jesus is coming back again. That's the truth. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells us that. We don't know if it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, no-trib. We don't know what that might look like exactly. We have some ideas. But we do know that Jesus was very specific, that at some point he is coming back, and it will be at a time that we least expect it, and we should be ready. He said, you remember what he said about if you knew that the thief was coming into your house at night? You'd be ready, right? You'd be right there with your uh, trusty shotgun. There wouldn't be a thief in your house. But what he said is, when Christ comes back, it'll be like a thief in the night. But you know what? God is a good, good father. He didn't say, okay, I've got this plan, and I'm going to send Jesus back. Good luck, y'all. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I hope you're ready when Jesus comes not back. If you're not, too bad for you. You're going to hell. He didn't say that, did he? Remember that song, God is watching from a distance? That's not what our God did. Our God is a good, good father. And he wants us to be successful. He wants us to have fellowship with him for all eternity. And so he gave us, his children, Say, I'm his child. I'm his child. his child. He gave us his very own spirit and the love of his son. Do you remember the last time I spoke that I talked about the egg? Remember this? This is a good example that God gave us of the Trinity. This is the egg. It contains it all. Its purpose, the shell, is to contain everything within it. The white on the inside feeds the embryo. It protects it. It cushions it. It gives them water. But it's still contained within that shell with a different purpose. The yolk inside gives nutrient to that embryo, but it's still contained within this egg. God wanted us to be successful. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Lord Jesus Christ so that we to be successful. The thing of it is, is God gave the church a purpose. First of all, he wanted us to be trained so that we would be ready when he comes back. He doesn't want any surprises, right? Remember that when he comes back, the Bible says that there are people that are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't I serve you? Didn't I do what you wanted me to do? And Christ is going to say, I never mm -hmm. knew you. Why is that? It's because they didn't know what it was that God expects from his children. And the second purpose of the church is to partner with him to bring in the pre-saved. God knows who he's called, and we'll just call them pre-saved. For his church, his plan was to put in, first of all, helping hand workers. Those were his apostles, which have a heart that reveals strategy for the church, and they were more of a governor. There's the prophet in the church that's like a mouth that communicates God's ideas and his words to you. The words of the prophet are to be encouraging, comforting, and urging you to be your best. God doesn't want you to be mediocre. He wants you to be your best. And then he gave teachers, and they are to bring wisdom and understanding. And it's a very scary thing 
when you do t when you do the teaching and the preaching mode because God says guess what you are to tell the rest of the body of Christ what it is that I want from them and if not you stand with an even greater judgment and you do remember that each one of us will stand before the throne of God and give account of what we've done it says that every hidden thing will come to light. And I cringe a bit when I think about my thoughts and my words. But they're going to be there. But you know what? I can say, yes, I did do that. But the Lord Jesus Christ has covered me. I am covered. And I am washed white as snow. Evangelists gather. Pastors are your guards. Did you know that? They're the, the feet that move to bring his sheep to the comfort and to righteousness. Pastor Mike is concerned about your life. What are you doing? What's going on in it? You need to tell us the things that are going on in your life so we know how to help. In addition to those, he gave what we call manifestation gifts in the church. Prophecy, speaking in tongues, interpretation of what those words might mean, faith, <clears throat> healing, miracles, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, and the discerning in spirits. And then he gave those motivational gifts. Serving, teaching others, giving, encouragement, administration, leadership, mercy, and here's the thing, every single one of you was given a gift to make the church grow and to make it be its best. Every one of you was given a gift. You know what, if just one person tries to do something, that's not what God planned. He didn't say, I'm going to give a pastor and the pastor is going to have all those five-fold things. He didn't say that. He said, I am giving administration type gifts and ministry gifts. I am giving mercy gifts. I am giving giving gifts. He gave you something when the Lord Jesus Christ came to live inside of you. So the thing is, which gifts do you have? Are you using them? And how might you use them? more. Which gifts did God give to you? Remember that God's plan is to train us up so that we're going to be ready when he comes back. And that we can also bring people into God's family. You know what? When we consider hell as a reality, not one of us wants a family member to be there. That's not the place that we want them to be. And the thing of it is, is hell a real place? You know, it really doesn't matter what I want it to be. It doesn't even matter what I think. What it matters is what God said about hell. And you know what? Jesus did talk about the reality of hell. In Matthew 10, 28, he said, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Ed Elliott is a researcher. Now, it's hard for me to even just read things. This man took the words of the Bible and put them in a computer. He said he wanted to find out if Jesus really did talk about hell. What he discovered is there are 1,900 verses in the four Gospels that contain Jesus' words. Did you ever sit there and count them? Well, I'm going to tell you what they are now in case you ever want to have a fact to bring out at a family gathering to really impress somebody. There are 1,900 verses that contain Jesus' words. Out of those, only 60 of the verses, 
talk either directly or indirectly to hell. But here's the problem, okay? 3% of those verses, just 60 of them, oh wait. What? Even 3% of the verses that Jesus talked about, he talked about hell, is Jesus a liar? No. Was Jesus just throwing out words? No. <clears throat> but he had something that he wanted us to know about that. He wanted us to know that hell is a real place and that we have a purpose. But on top of that, three times as many verses talk about heaven, eternal life, and his coming kingdom. The thing of it is, Jesus wanted us to know for sure that God did talk about hell, but he didn't want to scare us into heaven. He wants to love us into heaven. And he doesn't want to scare people that we talk about into heaven. He wants to love <coughs> them into heaven. But the truth of the matter is, and that I'm trying to get in my heart, is Jesus was very, very clear about the fact that he is coming back and about the fact that we have to choose between a heaven and a hell. And I have people in my family that I love with my whole heart, that they may know about Jesus and even like him, but they're living a life that is nothing like what the Bible says. Our God is a God of hope, peace, and love. But he is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that means that he has values. A minister died and went to heaven. And ahead of him at the pearly gates was a guy in sunglasses, a leather jacket, just kind of hanging out as he sauntered toward the gate. The guy said to St. Peter, I'm Joe Nestorenko, cab driver from Las Vegas. St. Peter gave him a golden robe, a golden staff, and pointed into a big mansion down the road. Then it was the minister's turn. Hi, I'm Elmer Lundberg, pastor of Zion Lutheran, no offense Lutheran here, but Zion Lutheran for 45 years. St. Peter gave him a cotton robe and a wooden staff and pointed him to a small wooden mansion further on down the road. The minister was astounded. But St. Peter, that man was a taxi driver and he gets a golden robe and a golden staff. I've been serving you for 45 years as a pastor and you gave me a cotton robe and a wooden pole. St. Peter said, you know what? Up here we go by results. While you preached, people slept. While he drove, people prayed. <laughs> so what are God's values for us? First of all, he said, love the Lord your God and keep his requirements, his laws, and his commands. You know, if we read over those every so often, say weekly, and asked ourselves, how are we doing? That would give us a good indication of where we needed to go on our knees and how it is that we needed to change. The truth of the matter is, it's very easy to come to church and worship the Lord God with all of your heart on Sunday and go home and say, you know what, Monday through Saturday, I'm going to live the way I want to live. It's just human nature. It's an easy thing to do. What did God say? Remember, I don't remember how many years back, Gary made the Ten Commandments for us to post on our doors and we talked a lot about those. It's well for us to take a, look, uh, a really good look at it. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. And that doesn't mean that it has to be a clay idol. It can be an idol of recreation. It can be an idol of money. It can be an idol of another person. But what does he say? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Think about that one. That one's kind of gone by the way in our, our society. Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, and you shall not covet. That is what God is going to look at us and say, how did you do in those areas? And remember that God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Jesus summed all that up in a very quick sentence in Matthew 7, 12. So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this is the sum of the law and the prophets. We used to all know the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Again, something that's kind of gone by the wayside. A lot of people don't know it anymore. But this is what God's going to look at us and judge you for. And here's the thing. The reason that Pastor Mike is going down the road of talking about the, the second coming and the, the things he, we want you to know is the fact is that God's going to look at you when you stand before him and he's going to say, how did you do in each of these areas? And he'll look at us and say, did you tell them? Did you tell them? that God is asking this of them? Did you tell them that I will judge someone according to what I have written in my Bible? Did you tell them? And so we're telling you. It's not always the most fun thing to say, but you know, we're all there together, every one of us. Every decision we make has to be weighed against what God's values are for us. He didn't hide his values at all. He said them in the Old Testament, he said them in the New Testament, and he said them where? In your heart. Right? Now God knows we're not perfect, and so he sent Jesus, right? And all of our sins are covered. But God does expect us to grow. If you've been a Christian for 20 years, and you don't feel like you have even a little bit closer relationship with Jesus, you might want to be asking yourself, why is that? Am I spending time with Jesus? Am I praying at all? I don't know about you guys, but I have great plans every day about the time that I'm going to spend with Jesus. And then lots of things get in the way. You know, we have to deliberately choose and make a time that we can spend with our God. Because he does expect us to grow. And he does expect us to repent when we do the things that he's telling us that we should not do. God is asking us to ask ourselves, are we using words and actions that Jesus would say and do if he was standing there with us? In the things that are going on in the world today, I look at him and I say, would Jesus be there? Would he be doing that? That's how I know if it's in accordance with God's plan or not. 
Remember the old, what would Jesus do? What was that, WW? Somebody help me. <clears throat> JD? Yeah. That's a really good thing. You know, I think I should probably put that on my hand to remind myself, what would Jesus do? And frankly, I'm asking for your help from this church. We are called to be mighty prayer warriors. You are called to be a mighty prayer warrior. And our nation has a problem. We call ourselves Christians, but then we take a look at the actions that we're doing that are in our, in our television shows, in our games, in our media, wherever that we are. In many ways, we're like the Laodicean church. We're neither hot nor we're cold, right? I mean, we call ourselves Christians, but how do our actions stand up to those? We throw the name of, of God around as if it's a common adjective. You know, it just stabs me sometimes when I'm watching a children's show and we still are God this, God that, not in worship, but as a swear word. You know, I don't see us going, all of this, all of that. No, because there's something about the name of the living God that is holy and different than any other name out there. And that has been something that we have taken and we use it as a word of anger. As a nation, we have allowed abortion, even though God says, thou shalt not murder. The thing of it is, people have had abortions, but you know, when they come to God and they say, Father, I didn't know, or I'm sorry, it's covered by the blood of Jesus. It's not an issue. But when we deliberately allow abortion in our nation, do you think that our God can just turn his head and look the other way? God is raising up his church now. Right now, things are changing. The church is getting its voice. People are marching. People are going into the streets and worshiping. Thousands of Christians together in Portland worshiping the name of the living God. Christians are rising up, but he's asking us, do we have a voice for those unborn children? You know, the question is, well, when does life begin? You know what? God didn't leave any question as to when life began. He put it right here. He said, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed, unformed substance in your book. At that time, when this child was still unformed, in your book, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, were written when as yet there was none of them. In God's eyes, there's no question as to when did life begin. And he's asking his church, he's asking you, he's asking me to stand up for those who don't have a voice. Our God is a God of justice, and he's asking us to use our voice to stand up for those things. Exodus 23, keep far from a false charge and do not kill the innocent and the righteous. Genesis 9, and for your life blood I will require a reckoning. Did you know this? From every beast, that's like a lion, that's like a dog, a cat. From every beast I will require it and from man. There are six things that the Lord hates, even that are abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, and those that run to evil. 
And so they asked him in Jesus in Matthew 19. They asked him. Teacher, what m good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied. There is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, obey the commandments. Which ones? The man required. Like, let's pick and choose some. I'm, I'm with him. Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. So basically, Jesus said to this young man, it's all those things, not just because they were in the Old Testament, but because they're in the New Testament. Our nation is being called into repentance and returning to God. In reality, it's nothing about how you and I feel. God really doesn't care how I feel about what he put in his book. There are many times when I'm reading the Bible that I go, well, God, I don't think that's very fair. He didn't say, you know, I looked for your opinion. That's not what he said. What's here is here. He's called us to stand up for the living God and follow his commandments and principles and guidelines. The thing of it is, you were created for such a time as this. You could have been born any time, any place, but you're here now. You know, and this is definitely not my, my favorite topic. You know that I would much rather be able to stand and simply tell you how wonderful you are in God's eyes, how much he loves you, that when he made you, he knew you by name, and he had something special for you that only you could do and no one else can do, and that God looks at your face every day and that God has his eyes on you all the time. If he always knows how many hairs are on our heads, he always has his eyes on you. That's my heart. That's what I want to tell you. But God said to me today, these people were created at such a time as this. And I stand here to tell you that in the spiritual realm, you are powerful warriors and your prayers carry power. There is no one just like you. I told you a story once before, and I'm going to tell it to you again. There's a man who was raised in a warlock home, and he has a ministry now. And he tells a story that his father had come back and told to him. His father wanted to go in and harass a man in the town. And the way he was going to do it is he was going to project himself through the wall and go in and harass that man's mind, send him into depression, the things that were there. And this man, who is a warlock, said that his father had that ability. He had the ability to project himself and to be into another person's mind. He went to this person's house, and he was heading to go through the wall, and he hit a brick wall. He could not enter that house, and he went what is wrong with this? I have been here often to harass this person. And he looked inside, and with this man in the house, there were four or five young people sitting there praying with him from a local church. They knew him by name, and they had come to pray with him and to talk with him about Jesus. And as they prayed, this man's father said the room lit up with a brilliant light, so bright that he couldn't even look at it. And he told his son, even then, if these people knew the power that they have in the spiritual realm, they would be on their knees as often as they could. And that's the thing. We don't know the authority and the power that God has given us. Your prayers 
carry a mighty weight when you pray. And you were called for such a time as this. We are the ones who are going to cause this nation to change. We are the ones who can bring Christ's love and God's plan here, now, at this time. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift your name on high. Father God, we thank you because we know that you have us in the palm of your hand. We thank you, Father God, that you're interested in each one of your children and that you want us to be the best that we can. Father, we just praise you because you're concerned about how we're feeling. You're concerned about the things in our life. Father, we want to bring those in our congregation that are hurting physically, mentally, emotionally. Father, we just ask for your amazing comfort and for your healing hand. Because you said, you said, you are the God who forgives all of our sins. You said that in Psalms 103. You are the God who forgives all our sins. You are the God who heals all our diseases. You are the God who crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercies. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your caring. Father, we thank you that you didn't leave us without instructions on how you want us to be. We thank you that you empower us through the Holy Spirit and the Lord Jesus Christ to live the lives that you want for us. Father, you are a mighty God. There is no one like